Hello, good evening, everyone. We're so glad that you're here. We're going to get started here in a, in a minute or two. We want to just make sure that everyone has a chance to get on. So we'll um, give people time to get logged into the webinar, but we're glad you're here with us tonight. Um, my name is Amy Onder. I'm the president and CEO of the Lucas Foundation of America Heartland Chapter. Um, our chapter is headquartered here in St. Louis, but we serve the state of Missouri, Southern and Central Illinois, and Kansas. Um, if you are here tonight, give us a wave or a hi, or you can let us know you're here um, by typing in the question section um, or the chat section, wherever you're comfortable with, and just let us know you're here and also let us know where you're uh, here from. What city are you from? We'd love to hear from you, but um, if nothing else, just give us a little click hi so we know that you're here. Um, I also, before we get started, I want to um, fill you in on a couple of um, upcoming programs that you might be interested in attending. Um, coming up on Tuesday, November the 9th, um, we have a really great um, webinar, especially if you are um, someone who works with lupus. Um, and this is uh, common mistakes when asking for accommodations from your employer and how to avoid them. We are doing this um, with LSUP. Um, and Paula Morgan from ALSEP will be sharing ways that people with disabilities can avoid common return to work mistakes when starting the conversation about accommodations with your employer to ensure that you receive the support you need in the workplace. So really encourage you to sign up for that one. Even if it's not something you need now, you may need it down the road. And then on Thursday, November 18th, we have uh, Bringing the Fight to Lupus Nephritis. And this program is being um, in, done in conjunction with Arinia. And uh, nephrologist Dr. Abdul Abdalatif will discuss lupus nephritis mm -hmm. and new and different treatment options. Um, and we're also, we'll also hear from a person who is living with lupus nephritis and talk about their personal journey. And finally, um, if you're interested in connecting with others living with lupus, we invite you to join us on our monthly um, lupus support group, which is uh, currently meeting online um, until further notice. Um, if you want more information about any of these programs, you can go to our website at lupus.org slash heartland, and you can find all that information there. Before I introduce our presenter, I want to remind you that the information that is provided in this webinar is for general information and educational purposes only, and it is not a substitute for your own physician's advice. The views expressed tonight are not necessarily those of the Lucas Foundation of America. Tonight's program is being recorded, and um, we will share that soon on our YouTube channel. If you don't currently subscribe to our YouTube channel, I encourage you to do that. And again, you can go to our website, lupus.org slash heartland. Um, and you can get the link for that. And if you subscribe, then you'll get uh, notifications every time we upload a new video. Um, if Again, if you have any questions, so Dr. Kim is going to do a, a presentation and then he's going to uh, have time at the end for Q&A. You'll go to the question section and ask your question there. I would please ask you not to ask specific questions um, because Dr. Kim is not your doctor and he won't be able to answer specific questions about your specific um, health. So just, just be aware of that. If you wanna ask general questions, um, that would be um, better. So we encourage you to do that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce our speaker and then we'll get started. And again, um, if you're just joining us, please let us know you're here. Um, type us a little note in the chat or the question section. So Dr. Um, Al Kim is an assistant professor of medicine, pathology and immunology at the Division of Rheumatology at the School of Medicine at Washington University. He is also the co-director of the Lupus Clinic at Washington University. Dr. Kim runs an independent research group investigating the role of B cells in kidney disease, biomarker testing in lupus and genetic suspect, suspect what's the word? Suspectiality, what is that word? Susceptibility. Susceptibilities of autoimmunity. See, I'm not, I'm gonna change this next time. I'm not saying all that. He is on the board of directors at the Lupus Foundation of America Heartland chapter. And he's also a member of the board of directors of the St. Louis Rheumatology Association. Many of you um, have heard Dr. Kim speak and we are so pleased that he shares his time with us. So Dr. Kim, take it away. I appreciate it, Amy. And I appreciate everyone who's,
been able to log on and uh, join us this evening. Um, so uh, this is kind of a bit of a challenging talk simply because there are so many ways to test for lupus. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on really kind of the the main um, aspects of it, uh, kind of the the core uh, lab tests that are going to be driving uh, the initial decision making, and oftentimes also uh, with each visit, you'll get certain labs being done every time, and they may not be explained to you as well as they need to be. So we're going to try to do that, and then on top of that, we're going to also um, uh, uh, talk for about maybe 10 minutes at the end about talking about managing lupus flares, but I'm going to present it in a way that is um, different than I think of what I would have presented five years ago. And this is largely because of some new research that is making us think about flares in a different way. So I am realizing that my slides have, I'm going to redo my slides here one second here. All right, I think I'm active here. Okay, one second, sorry. I'm gonna, hold on. I apologize, just a little technical issue here. Okay. All right, why is it not? Hold on. I think I'm going to need to do it this way. I, I'm sorry. Okay, now you're seeing uh that's one let me go ahead and move to the screen okay that's better okay so one of the main issues that we have in uh, rheumatology is that um, our lab tests are actually are very inaccurate for what i think a lot of people think are you know the reasons why those lab tests exist for example um, we really don't have lab tests for lupus we don't have lab tests for rheumatoid arthritis what we do have are tests that help us push us in a direction or away from the direction of a certain diagnosis. Uh, what I tell our med students here is that uh, rheumatology is very similar to psychiatry uh, clinically simply, simply because many of our diseases are not diseases that are um, uh, based off of x-rays or CT scans or labs, but they're based mostly on symptoms. So for example, there's no blood test for anxiety. There's no blood test for schizophrenia. Uh, those are what we call clinical diagnoses. This is what the patient presents us with as a, per, as a healthcare provider. Rheumatology largely is the same way. There's a certain set of symptoms, a certain set of um, things that we pick up on physical exam that then makes us think of certain diseases. And then we get lab tests that modify that. So in a way, you never really have the situation where a lab test tells us you have this disease. That does not exist. But as a result, I think a lot of uh, clinicians who aren't as experienced in rheumatic diseases tend to overcall these type of things. So really, my first main take-home point here is that labs suggest the presence or absence of lupus or a lupus flare, but the labs by themselves don't mean very much. Right? And this is the single biggest challenging aspect for our trainees as they come up um, to be uh, full-fledged rheumatologists in our fellowship programs, and also for non-rheumatologists that are ordering these type of labs and trying to figure out what do they mean. It's not clear cut, and this is probably very frustrating for a lot of the patients to hear this. So we'll talk about how some of our most commonly ordered labs in lupus are misinterpreted, and then tell you what the proper interpretation is. So I'm going to really focus on five different labs, ANAs, antinuclear antibodies, DSDNA, this is double-stranded deoxy uh, uh, ribose nucleic acid, um, and then uh, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, CRP, C-reactive protein, and then the complement component C3 and C4. We'll start off with antinuclear antibodies because this is the most confusing lab test, even though the implications of the test are actually very minimal. 
So the often the misinterpretation that's given clinically is that even a positive ANA, you have lupus. The real way to interpret this, and there's caveats, obviously. And I'll go into these caveats because I think they are important as a an example of the complicated issues of testing in uh, rheumatology and particularly lupus is that if you have a positive ANA, you're actually unlikely to have lupus. This is not what patients perceive the test to be for sure. So while almost everyone with lupus has a positive ANA, the opposite is definitely not true. Most people with a positive ANA do not have lupus. Okay, so how does this play out? The history of ANAs and the reason why they've become so central to lupus was made uh, over 50 years ago. And essentially before this ANA test existed, there was this uh, phenomenon that was observed under microscopy called the lupus erythematosus cell or the LE cell. You actually, uh, uh, what the researchers had found back in the 50s was that actually if they went into the bone marrow, which is not a trivial process, right? They actually pulled out some of the bone marrow, they looked under the microscope, and what they found were, so these are gonna be normal immune cells in the bone marrow, but they found these type of cells with this large uh, kind of hole in the middle, as you can see here, this kind of big glob inside of the cell. Again, this cell in the right in the middle is supposed to look like the one at four o'clock. But what had happened was this particular immune cell had taken in some debris from other cells and basically ate it. And that phenomenon was very specific to lupus. They later found out about 10, 15 years later that these anti-nuclear antibodies actually caused this process to occur. And that's the reason why sometimes in the old, old textbooks, particularly for like the healthcare providers that are in the audience, the LE cell, cell was used as an initial test for lupus. Later on, obviously, since ANA testing became more uh, um, uh, available and it's a lot easier to just get blood rather than bone marrow, then the ANA test replaced it. So there are several ways ANA tests are done, and this is part of the problem. The gold standard way is to use what's called indirect immunofluorescence, and they use the cell called a HEP2 cell. Essentially what's happening is these HEP2 cells are stuck on the bottom of a slide. You take the patient's sample and you put it onto the slide. Now, anti-nuclear antibodies or ANAs will, if present, will bind to that cell. And then there's a way to detect it with uh, essentially kind of a fluorescent glowing tag on that um, detection material, which then allows you to look under the microscope and pick up for ANAs. So a lot of these ANAs are, um, are, are reported as a titer or a dilution. So you basically take someone's um, blood and you dilute it, dilute it, dilute it out until you can't see a signal anymore. And then that's when the titer is reported. And then it's also reported as a pattern. Sometimes they're called diffuse, speckled, nucleolar, peripheral, discrete. These have lost meaning over time simply because we have other tests that can help replace what these, uh, uh, these patterns mean. But nevertheless, it, one can imagine just looking at these different patterns here, that this is very technically demanding. Uh, this is um, not every lab actually can do this and requires a fair amount of experience to read correctly. In other words, a lot of this is very expensive to do um, as gold standards tend to be um, expensive. Now, more recently, well, not that recently, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, uh, another technique called ELISA, known as enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, replacing or starting to replace the HEP2 assay to measure ANAs. And this is actually a much simpler technical uh, 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 issue. So basically, you have um, uh, uh, a compound at the bottom of a petri dish, a little culture dish in the lab, and then you basically add in the patient's sera. It's that, that little substrate, that little thing at, at the bottom here replaces that HEP2 cell. So the HEP2 cell obviously has to be alive in order for that particular assay to work. Here, nothing needs to be alive. You just have it at the bottom of a Petri dish. And then once you're adding on someone's sera that has anti-nuclear antibodies in it, then you can add that detection. Then basically the well, it glows a different color. I have an example of one here. I just pulled it from Wikipedia, but this is a very, you know, we do these in the labs, you know, uh, in our lab, you know, uh, dozens a day. But basically, the, uh, the darker the color, the more ANA is in there. And so as a result, instead of being reported as a dilution or a titer, this is just reported as a level. 
And because this is so simple to do, and now it's largely done by robotics, it is very cheap and inexpensive to do. Now, this is where the one problem comes into play. There's a huge difference in how the HEP2 results relate to lupus and how the ELISA results relate to lupus. Now, I'm gonna do a little bit of a deep dive here. Um, I know some of my patients are gonna be on uh, this webinar and I uh, tell them right off the bat, I want them to be the smartest and the most sophisticated lupus patients out there. And I will talk to them like I'm talking to a colleague. And so this is one of those examples where I'm gonna be talking to you like I'm talking to my colleague, all right? So essentially the main home run point is in this little tiny box on the right side here, which is four numbers. HEP2 in the top row, ELISA in the bottom, something called sensitivity here in this column, in the um, uh, first column here. And what sensitivity is, is really the true positive rate. In other words, let's say that, okay, 97% HEP2 sensitivity. That meant for the positive tests of, of the people with lupus, the HEP2 test was positive 97% of the time, okay? And then the bottom here is going to be the sensitivity for ELISA. That was 80%. In other words, uh, of the, say, 100 people with lupus, 80% of the time, the ELISA ANA test turned positive. The other way to think about this, though, too, is that um, 3% of lupus patients through a HEP2 assay had a false negative. It should be positive, but it's negative, right? And then 20% of people that had a, uh, an ELISA done uh, with lupus actually had a false negative. In other words, 80% had a positive, 20% had a negative, when 100% of them should have been positive, right? And so this sensitivity gives us an ability to be able to identify potential false negatives, okay? Specificity is the opposite. In other words, specificity is gonna be the true negative rate. So you have 100 people with you that you know that don't have lupus and then you run this assay, okay? 40% of those people with HEP2 are going to have a negative ANA. Remember, these are lupus, uh, these are patients without lupus. So in theory, in theory, their ANA should be negative. But here you can see that it's 40% uh, for HEP2. It actually goes up to 70%, which is better. In other words, of the 100 people without lupus, 70% of them or 70 of them actually had a negative ANA. But again, you could flip that around and actually say that the issue with um, ELISA is that the HEP2 actually has more false positives because 60% of the um, people without lupus actually had a positive ANA versus 30% of the people with a, without lupus had a positive ANA, okay? That's kind of complicated, but this is the core kind of issues that we think about in terms of testing, sensitivity and specificity. So to repeat, the home run points here is that the HEP2 is more sensitive than ELISA, which means that ELISA has way more false negatives, all right? In other words, it should be positive when it's negative. ELISA though is more specific than HEP2, and that means more HEP2, uh, that means the HEP2 assay has more false positives. Now, when you're trying to now think about how does this play out in the real world and when we're ordering tests, some people would argue, well, I want the ELISA because um, that, you know, when it's positive, I'm more sure that it's lupus. And that's true. That is true. A positive ELISA gives you more confidence that this person has lupus by itself. But the problem is, is that it's still only 70%, so it's not close to 100%. The HEP2, when it's positive, colloquially, it just means you're alive, basically, right? But the thing is, is that when it's negative, all right, you can almost 100% exclude lupus, all right? So this is the reason why I still prefer my tests done by HEP2, because the negative result means something to me. The positive result is almost irrelevant. ELISA, it, it's more blurry, all right? The negative result actually is less meaningful. The positive result is a little more meaningful, a little more meaningful, but it's not in more, it's not, the meaningfulness does not increase enough for me to really rely on it as a test because I can't exclude or include anything using ELISA. Yes, ELISA is a technical advancement. 
It is a cheaper, a faster way to get these results, but the, the results themselves are limited in my ability to interpret them because they tend to uh, represent the gray zone, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity. All right, so this is again, a huge thing that we try to cha uh, train our fellows is when you get a, um, a patient coming in that has a positive ANA and they're, you're evaluating them for lupus, they need to know exactly how the test was done what company did the test and what platform was used uh, for that test, okay? So let's assume that everything is HEP2. Let's assume everything is HEP2, all right? Now you want to be able to ask the question, does the positive HEP2 test tell you anything more about lupus? I gave you a little sneak um, hint in the prior slide and also at the introduction, but this study is kind of a classic one. It's an old study, it's 1996. And it basically said, if you asked how many people with a positive ANA have an autoimmune disease such as lupus, all right, what percentage of those people actually test, actually end up having that disease? And when you calculate the numbers, again, this is just a simple two by two table here. But if you take the 33 people with a positive ANA that have um, a, a autoimmune disease, and you divide that by the total here, which is gonna be 150, which is 120 plus 33. You only get, of the positive ANAs, only 20% of these people actually having any sort of autoimmune disease. That means 80% of them don't have an autoimmune disease and are otherwise healthy. Let's think about that, all right? A positive ANA still means, if you, even if you include all autoimmune diseases, that you're healthy. That's the simplest interpretation until otherwise proven. It's even worse for lupus, I don't have that data on the slide, that this drops down to almost 10%. In other words, one out of every 10 um, positive ANA tests that roll into our offices office have lupus. Nine out of 10 do not have lupus. So if this is the example I give all the time, some of you have heard me give this, is that let's say you were given $10,000 of chips and you went to Vegas, all right? And they had the ANA game. All right, and you have two options to throw ten thousand dollars of chips towards healthy or lupus. All right, you would be, you would have to go to healthy, right? You would double up nine out of ten times. All right, if you threw it to lupus, you most likely you're going to be you're going to lose that ten thousand dollars of chip. If you threw it towards healthy and the ten sided die rolled up lupus, you're actually unlucky. All right, so this is the reason why I say. If you are, you are unlucky to have lupus if you have a positive ANA, okay? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time with this because this is such a confusing test for people because they overinterpret, misinterpret the results. They interpret it too deeply. There's no nuance. And as a result, this can lead to problems, okay? All right, let's move on to double-stranded DNA. This is similar to ANA. Um, if, you know, that the misinterpretation is that if you have lupus, you have a positive double-stranded DNA test. It's not as bad as the ANA, but the thing is, probably the best, better way to say it is that even if it is positive, you still may not have lupus. Having a positive double-stranded DNA does indicate which, with much more um, uh, clarity that someone may have lupus. But again, it's not definitive. It's not definitive. So there are ways you can over and misinterpret the results of this test. The other reason why is that you thought ANA testing was um, was a mess. Double strain and DNA testing platforms are all over the place, and this is what we're going to talk about next year. I don't. I'm, I'm just listing the eight different ways that uh, double strain DNAs can be measured, and the gold standard is something called Crithidia. Um, in the fluorescence test, we just call it a uh, Cliff test. This is it's actually listed down in the kind of the fifth one down here. The Cliff test is um, the gold standard because it measures pure. It, it, it can 100% measure. Uh, the presence for double-stranded DNA uh, uh, antibodies. Sometimes uh, single-stranded DNA antibodies can uh, cause a false positive in some of these tests. Here, the gold standard is this CLIF test. You, there's no possibility of that. So that's the reason why it's the gold standard, but it's very labor-intensive, and as, as a result, it's also very expensive. The most common way to do it are the bottom two ones, ELISA, which we just talked about with ANAs, and then a multiplex assay, which essentially uses beads, very, very similar to ELISA. And the reason why these are more common is because they can be robotically performed, and as a result, you can do a, you know, numerous samples at, at any given time. So it's easy to do. You can go through many samples at the same time, and as a result, it becomes very cheap. Now, 
The problem is, is that all of these tests, if you give them the same samples, give you slightly different results, okay? So we just went through the sensitivity specificity mess before. I'm gonna let you focus on the bottom three here, this double-stranded ELISA, this is an LE spy here, and this, this is a crithidia here, all right? Actually, I want you to focus on the far right column here, the positive predictive value for lupus. In other words, when that test is positive, what are the chances that that person actually ended up having lupus? For the ELISA, which is our most common, when you have a positive double-stranded DNA test there, 50%, it's no better than flipping a coin. You might as well not even order the test and just flip a coin, okay? Because that's the best you're getting if it's, if it's positive, all right? B test, very similar, it's only 53%. Again, the crithidia is 94%. So if a positive test by crithidia, 90, if so, 90, yeah, there's a 94% chance that that person that had that positive test will have lupus, okay? And so all of the old data on double-stranded DNA and lupus was all done with crithidia. But again, since it's so expensive and it's hard to do, everyone has shifted over to these newer platforms. These newer pl platforms do not perform as well, okay? And so this is, again, uh, an issue that we tell our trainees and you, and our uh, also um, rheumatologists everywhere is that you have to know which company is doing this test and how is that test being done, all right? There are very few that do crithidia anymore. Even here at Barnes Jewish Hospital, they don't do crithidia anymore because it's too expensive. Okay, so this is problematic, and this adds to a huge mountain of uncertainty, you know. And so again, you could have three double-stranded DNA tests done three different ways. They're all positive, but that they mean something different, each one of them, all right? That's, that's problematic, all right? So the two ways rheumatologists use these double-stranded DNA antibody results, one is for the diagnosis of lupus and one's for monitoring flares. The diagnosing, I just told you, right? The differences in the testing platforms makes it really tough to understand without, uh, to just blindly interpret without having the context of patient information there. What kind of symptoms do they have? Um, what do their other labs look like? In terms of flare monitoring, there are ways, if you use the same test, the same platform, that you can use the um, double-stranded DNA and the levels will match the activity of their disease. So if they're flaring, double-stranded DNA levels will go up. And as they go into remission because of treatment, double-stranded DNA levels go down. But this is only true in about a third of lupus patients. Two thirds of lupus patients, this doesn't apply to, all right? So there's a problem with that. Again, lucky for the third where this double-stranded DNA antibody level can fluctuate with disease activity and flares, but what about the other two thirds? We're missing the boat with those, okay? So this is, like, I think, another good example where using the test by itself without that clinical context and experience of a rheumatologist will likely lead that um, physician to um, go down the wrong path, okay? So we're going to switch from antibodies, the antinuclear antibody and double-stranded DNA antibodies, to a couple of other lab tests that are much simpler to do and to explain. The most common one that I think are used in lupus patients routinely in monitoring for flares is something called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. We just call it the ESR. This has to be the easiest test the lab does in the entire world. You basically take some blood, you add some anticoagulant. So like when they take blood from you, there's different color tops on the tubes. Each of them have a different additive. So either if it's going to be a um, a, uh, a purple top typically is what we use. Uh, it's going to be something called EDTA, which prevents the blood from clotting. That's sufficient. And so that blood that comes out of a purple top tube, you just pop the top off, you take some of that blood and you put it into these tubes in this, uh, basically this rack. And you just let the blood sit there for an hour. And then when you come back, then you read how much of the blood has settled down towards the bottom. So you can see, this is uh, actually a picture from the Mayo a uh, uh, lab website is that the higher your ESR, the more clearing you have off the top. So all of these one hour ago were filled up to this top line and then they were able to settle for one hour. So you can see some people have very small ESRs in the first and second rows here or uh, columns here. The first, this third person in the middle here has a very high ESR. You can see how much of red blood cells have settled towards the bottom. And then you can see a uh, couple, number four and number six, moderate, uh, you know, kind of moderate ESR levels. And then uh, number four, uh, five here actually has uh, ESR essentially zero, 
all right? And that's how you read it. It's very simple to do. There's nothing complicated, all right? And you're just measuring that top. So what does ESR mean? So generally speaking, it, if I take a thousand lupus patients and treat all thousand like one patient, as we do in many of our studies through statistics, like you know when we say average, we're basically saying of the thousand people we're measuring, we're gonna treat them like one person. In, when you do that, the higher your ESR, the more likely you're gonna have active lupus. Right, so I'm gonna say that again. Generally speaking, the higher the ESR, the more likely you're gonna have active lupus. How high does the ESR have to be to say, oh, you have a flare with lupus? That tends to be very individual, individualistic. So everyone kind of lives in their own zone. And so you just have to be able to look back at their older labs to be able to see where their kind of where their comfort zone is and then see if they're above that comfort zone. Again, that's gonna be potential that's going to be different for a lot of, for each person, all right? So that again, even though the lab gives you normal and abnormal, we ignore that because we know that is much more individualized than just simple, you know, uh, reference ranges that you are typically given, all right? The problem though, is that even though ESR is a good test for lupus, it actually performs better in other autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. Again, why lupus behaves in this way is not really clear to us. And the other main issue here is it's really an indirect measure of inflammation. What, acute, what the ESR actually measures is um, the amount of something what we call acute phase reactants in the blood. These are hundreds of different types of proteins. Um, and um, some of them you may have heard of, uh, fibrinogen, C-reactive protein, ferritin, all of these out, go up and down based off of general inflammation in the body. So uh, what happens, let's say, in a lupus nephritis, a kidney attack in the, you know, with lupus, there you start to get any, some inflammation at the tissue, all right, in the kidney. The kidney then kind of shoots out signals, kind of these danger signals. One of these is an pr immune protein called interleukin-6 or IL-6. This IL-6 goes to the liver, actually, and then the liver then makes all these acute phase reactants, all right? And when the acute phase reactants then go into the bloodstream, they actually um, coat red blood cells and allow them to pack more densely when you do the ESR test, right? So when you have little inflammation and as a result, very low IL-6 levels, the liver's making very few acute phase reactants and now the red blood cells can't pack and as a result, your ESR is very uh, small. But in times of inflammation, this is not just lupus, could be a cold even. All right, or it could be cancer, right? There's a lot of things that can trigger high ESR, but in each of those situations, the output is exactly the same. You make more of this IL-6, the liver responds to that IL-6, and then you get this acute phase, what we call response. It coats the red blood cells, allows them to pack more, and you get more clearing and a higher ESR. So you can see this is indirect, right? You have to go through multiple steps to get to where you need to be. And so as a result, each step that you're not measuring, there could be some error, all right? And again, that's the reason why ESRs can be somewhat tricky to interpret. C-reactive protein, this is gonna be very straightforward and quick. This is almost entirely done by ELISA, and thankfully, the differences between the different companies that have ELISAs to CRP are um, very consistent. So we don't have any testing platform issues with CRP. And I just told you before that CRP actually makes up part of that ESR test, right? Because it's part of those acute phase reactants. The problem is, is that I know there are a handful of rheumatologists that still check CRPs for lupus. The reality is that CRP and lupus, um, they, there's no relationship. In our cohort here at WashU, and again, some of the patients um, that see us in our clinic here um, are online, and so I want to thank every one of them for participating in our research studies because here we were able to confirm that CRP that has no role in lupus at all. High CRP levels, even though it's indicative of inflammation, it doesn't relate to lupus. I'm not sure what it's relating to, but it doesn't relate to lupus, and vice versa is true. We see people with bad lupus flares, but their CRP levels are very low. Now, typically speaking, We've been more right than wrong if that if we have a lupus patient that's not feeling well, but their ES, but their CRP is elevated, this typically indicates a bacterial infection rather than a lupus flare. So when we see the elevated CRP, we are immediately thinking of infection and trying to see whether or not we can isolate the source of that infection. So that's how we interpret the CRP.
All right, the last thing, one of my favorite things to talk about is compliments. So compliment is actually a very prehistoric part of our immune system. It's found as far back as jellyfish, and it's really there to fight off bacterial infections. There are a whole bunch of parts of complement. It's this actually massive, over 50 components to it. Two of which though are measured routinely in the lab, and as a result, we use it in lupus. So basically C3 and C4 are also part of this acute phase response, and as a result, they can make up the ESR. So C3 and C4 basically, in normal situations, just floats around in the bloodstream, ready to be activated if there's a lupus flare or happens to, or a bacterial infection. Once it's activated, say it is in a lupus flare, what happens is that the C3 comes out of the bloodstream and attaches to your own cell, it gets stuck there, all right? And it gets stuck there for the lifetime of that cell, all right? That event, and then there's a couple additional steps downstream, causes inflammation locally within that tissue, say in the kidney and lupus nephritis. So as a result, what we typically do is we're trying to see if someone's C3, C4 is low, right because what you're measuring in the blood is going to be stuff that is floating around right as opposed to the stuff that's stuck on cells if it's stuck on a cell you're not going to be able to measure it in the blood right because it's stuck on a solid surface and you it can't get liberated back to the blood so typically speaking when we think of lupus flares and the ability for complement to be able to become activated during lupus flares we typically uh, teach that there's going to be a drop in C3 and C4 levels in the bloodstream, which then means that there's a possible flare going on. Now, having said that, it's a little bit more tricky. So uh, as some of you uh, know, we've been doing a fair amount of work with this uh, wonderful biotech company in St. Louis called Kaifa, who's interested in making kind of the next generation of complement tests. And the reason why you need better testing, other than the the past uh, 19 slides that I've presented is, I think, highlighted here very nicely. So this is just um, levels of C3 on the y-axis here. Active people here in red, active lupus, so flaring lupus, and people without active lupus, so these are pa lupus patients in remission, all right? And then you can see a kind of a scattering of C3 values from uh, our patients. So what's interesting is that um, in our lab, the lower limit of normal or the LLN of C3 is 90. So I just told you that if you're below 90, then this is indicative of a lupus flare. And indeed, that appears to be the case. About 85% of people with low C3 in this case, uh, we have same data for C4, but for C3, 85% of these people have an active flare going on, all right? So yes, a low C3, is very is helpful because it can help push you towards not 100 but definitely could push you towards a uh, lupus flare all right but the problem is the other side normal c3 and that's everything above this dotted line all right 40 percent for almost half of the people with a normal c3 are flaring all right that tells you how poorly c3 really performs all right. So yes, if you have a low C3, you're kind of lucky that it got caught that way because most of the time that means lupus flare. But if you have a normal C3, the problem here is that most people say, oh, you're not flaring. Actually, it's more, or less, it's more along the lines of a coin flip. They have a normal C3. Almost half of those people are indeed flaring. But then you may be misinterpreting it because we didn't fully realize how poorly that test performs in the normal range. Okay. So yes, if you have a low C3 or low C4, you're likely to have a lupus flare as long as you don't have a bacterial infection. Remember, I told you right at the top of this little section here that bacterial infections are really the main reason why we activate complement. But the majority of flaring lupus patients will still have a normal C3 and C4. And again, this is very problematic. And it's, it's another example of the challenges in the lab, um, how lab testing um, kind of, uh, it doesn't necessarily give the answer that we want as providers, and certainly not to as patients. All right, let's pivot now for the last 10 minutes before we open up for Q&A to flares. And I only have about three or four slides here because I kind of want to just more tell stories and, and, and provide overarching concepts rather than very specific details. So, um, you know, I think for a very long time, um, and I think a lot of patients, you guys can commiserate with this, 
is there are often disagreements in the doctor's office between the doctor in terms of what they're saying is a flare or not as a flare versus what you are saying is a flare and is not a flare. I never really fully understood why this was. Um, and maybe it's because we were being taught about the concept of a flare incorrectly, right? So I think the take home point from this section that I want you guys to go with is that not all of your symptoms that you're feeling are actually due to your lupus. And so as a result, identifying which one is related to inflammation and potentially more your lupus versus those that are not inflammatory, this is critical because this will help guide treatment in a more specific and safer way, all right? So what do I mean by this? So David Pitsetsky, among others, Jennifer Rogers at uh, Duke University, they have a wonderful lupus center there. They asked the same question. And so a couple of years ago, they had uh, proposed this model of thinking about lupus flares, which is quite a bit different than what we have typically been taught of um, coming out of school or of our training. So there's type one and type two. Type one basically is inflammatory organ injury and damage, right? And because it's inflammatory, it can respond to immunosuppression that we typically give for lupus patients. Um, you know, unfortunately, we still use prednisone, but there could be other drugs like azathioprine, mycophenolate, uh, belimumab, rituximab, or several others, right? And a whole bunch of things can be associated with inflammatory damage from lupus. You know, we've talked about lupus nephritis before, joint pain, like this very specific type of joint pain though, called inflammatory arthritis, uh, specific types of rashes. Uh, some people with chest pains can also have inflammatory changes. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that can also happen. Now, type two symptoms, these typically are non-inflammatory. And as a result, they don't typically respond to immunosuppression, right? Because immunosuppression's main role is to be able to reduce inflammation. But these symptoms are very profound. They, are, um, they affect quality of life more so than I think the type one symptoms. And these are the symptoms that our patients care about the most, right? Fatigue, diffuse pain, not just joint pain, but joint and muscle pain cognitive dysfunction, kind of a cloudy brain fog, the lupus fog type of thing, poor sleep, mood disorders like anxiety and depression. All of these are seen in lupus patients, but from what we can tell, they're actually not inflammatory. So if you give prednisone for these type of things, these type of things usually don't improve. Now you may see some improvement, say in fatigue, but that's a side effect of prednisone because prednisone has a side effect in almost everyone of causing euphoria. Right, so that is not the, uh, that doesn't necessarily um, mean that this is inflammatory. So this is actually an interesting way of putting it because I think most physicians think of lupus as type one and type one only. Most patients experience the type twos on almost on a daily basis and infrequently experience type ones. So you can see where there's a huge disconnect in terms of how the medical field thinks about lupus and how patients think about lupus. And so they, you know, the Duke group, I mean, it's not like they, you know, crack the code of lupus. This is pretty obvious once you see it in front of you. But I think this is a really nice way of thinking about it and that we are failing as a, and as a medical profession because we're not addressing the type two symptoms, okay? So the, I think the main problem for me with type two symptoms is that if it's not due to lupus, then what is it due to? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, I think this is now going to highlight some of the deficiencies in lupus care that we have in 2021, which I'll talk about in a slide or two. All right, so how do we manage these type of things? Okay, so type one, type two symptoms are very different in terms of their root cause. So as a result, their treatment is gonna have to be different. So type one symptoms, I think here, the medications that are prescribed are key, all right? Equally important is going to be sun protection. It's getting increasingly clear that ultraviolet light from the sun um, is a main trigger for lupus flares. Ultraviolet light from the sun is the main trigger of lupus flares. And that's the reason why we always are telling people to try to wear sunscreen all the time, particularly in between in, in the St. Louis area, in between say April through the end of September, just because of the you know the sun angles and everything. 
Um, an SPF 50 minimum that's applied every two to three hours. Um, you know, even though it feels greasy, the um, compound that absorbs the ultraviolet light and turns it actually into a red color, that's how most sunscreens work, you can't see it, all right? And so as a result, the, even though it's greasy, the compound that takes the ultraviolet light and turns it into safe light is all exhausted. So that's the reason why you have to keep reapplying. This is a pain in the ass, I get it, all right? But if you're going to be outside and you're trying to do your best to prevent flares, you really, this is starting, again, this is really becoming a critical uh, root cause for most flares, right? It's going through the skin and specifically because of ultraviolet light. Now, also, and this discussion is not easy to do with um, a lot of rheumatologists, unfortunately, but you have to figure out, okay, I'm not, if I'm not taking my meds as I'm, as I'm prescribing, but I want to, I need to figure out why, all right? Because again, for type one symptoms, the immunosuppressive medications as a whole are going to be your best friend, particularly hydroxychloroquine, all right? So if there are issues though, right, particularly side effects, you have to have a conversation with your rheumatologist to figure out, you know, how do we mitigate this? Is this something that I can deal with? Is this something I can't deal with? If it's something I can't deal with, then what are my options, all right? And then what am I expecting from those other options, all right, in terms of benefit and then also potential side effects, all right? The side effects aren't going to be, the, um, they obviously are not um, intentional, right? You know, these are just things that we can't control because of unknown biology. But the problem here too is that generally speaking, they happen in a minority of people, right? Usually less than 20% of people. But when it does happen, it can leave a very scarring uh, effect on your influence and your relationship with medications. So I want to make sure that you know everyone here has that healthy relationship with the rheumatologist to be able to openly discuss, you know what, I'm on azathioprine. I know we've been trying it for two years. I have to tell you, I haven't been taking it. I can't tolerate it. It just makes me feel like crap, all right? Then your rheumatologist has to have the respect to be able to say, okay, let's move on. Let's, I don't even want to know the specifics because it doesn't matter because we're not going to ever use it again, okay? So this type of discussions need to happen. The other thing that's related to this is going to be maintaining your visit schedules with your rheumatologist because there are certain labs that can be helpful, particularly if, let's say, your analysis, if you had lupus nephritis, there are ways to be able to pick up certain aspects in the urine that can help potentially predict the next flare, all right? So even though I talked about several different tests that, and not all of them are perfect, in collection, they can provide a, at least an arrow in which direction that we may be trending towards and we may need to be able to mitigate those issues, okay? So the key thing for type one symptoms, again, these are infrequent because the medicines work quite well, but you have to make sure that you are gonna be able to take your medicines and you can tolerate the medicines, all right? And the best way to make sure that this balance occurs is to make sure that there's an open uh, uh, dialogue with your rheumatologist. All right, the last slide, but this is the most complicated one lupus flares with type, type two symptoms, all right? These are admittedly more difficult to manage because they're non-inflammatory. And most likely it represents several different conditions that each need to be treated separately. So I've highlighted kind of key terms here in blue. So the first one, I think the most important is to discuss and rediscuss goals with your rheumatologist about what you expect in terms of your quality of life, all right? What are you willing to briefly sacrifice in the short term, which ones are you absolutely needing to be resolved now? Because this is then gonna tell your rheumatologist what other members in the healthcare community can help provide relief for you. This could be a sleep specialist, a dietitian, physical therapist, psychologist, et cetera. Now, I say this like the answer is very simple, but the reality is, is that many of these, um, are inaccessible to many of our patients, all right? That's a huge barrier in our healthcare system that is not, doesn't have a clear solution right now. For example, in the St. Louis area, it is really the psychiatry and psychology um, uh, kind of supply here is very, very low. So it is almost impossible for my lupus patients to get appropriate um, uh, care for their depression or their anxiety or how to manage it, all right? So this is problematic. We'll talk about the very end about you know methods that we'll tr we're trying to be able to mitigate this. 
Another aspect, social support is absolutely key. You know, if you feel like no one's listening to you, you're being discounted, you're, um, you know, no one's validating you, um, you feel like everyone's ignoring you, that's a huge problem, right? And the better the support that people have, the less intense the type two symptoms tend to be, all right? So obviously, getting support is a critical part for any part of being human. Now, the problem is, how do you get support? if you happen to be in an environment where your support isn't very strong. And I think this is going to be the third main point here, is trying to find programs that help improve self-management skills. So, you know, let's say that you've just been having a crappy, like, you know, October, and your health is just not feeling great, your depression is getting worse, your fatigue is crazy, you can't sleep at all. This is very demotivating, right? And so, as a result, you're not going to have the um, kind of the internal strength at that moment to try to overcome certain hurdles related to your health, right? It's just, it's just, you know, it's just too much, too much stress, too much uh, pressure, you know, too much physiologic energy being spent away on these other issues as opposed to trying to fix yourself. So having programs in self-management, and we have a very strong relationship with our occupational therapy group at WashU, who's, um, has a main, they have a program on improving self-management. So we've been um, quite fortunate to be able to send some of our patients over in their direction um, who really need help. Uh, they really actually primarily do it for people with dementia and their families, like Alzheimer's dementia, but they are starting to get some expertise within lupus. And so this is, again, something that could be helpful for uh, a fair number of lupus patients. Again, I'm talking about big macro ideas that are, when you're starting to think about it, like, well, how am I gonna get this done? That's, again, a really good question. Patience is key, though, all right? Um, it's a lot easier to say than it is to do, and it's very difficult to attain. Um, we, As we learn more about the type two symptoms and how to better address it, we will find solutions. We need time, though, because it's clear that we don't understand it. The experience of living with lupus is very different than the disease and its impact on, on people, right? Um, they, they kind of almost occupy two very different rooms in the same house. So we're working on these type of things, um, not just us here at WashU, but also globally, right? But then I think from the provider end, for any providers that are on here, and this is hard certainly in the private practice world, but you know, so we may need a more community-based approaches, but a team approach is going to be needed in the future. Like I listed already, sleep, uh, specialists, dietitian, physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, on top of nephrologists and dermatologists and rheumatologists. You know, this is something we're trying to do at WashU is basically have a self-contained home for lupus care. Um, it's not as easy as I want it to be. Um, I think all of the providers here are working hard to try to figure out how to make this um, a, 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 a kind of a program that is uh, financially sol um, uh, solvent. But at the same time, I think there are ways that we can make it so that uh, we can centralize, specialize lupus care for our patients. And that way, because of our team-based approach, many of the blue things up on the top here then become uh, more realistic. And if we can get these nailed down above, then the type two symptoms will erode, okay? So that is all I have slide-wise. I am open to chat with whoever, um, Whatever questions, again, uh, Amy pointed out that uh, specific personal medical questions, I'm not going to be able to answer, um, not only legally, but I just don't know the specifics of your disease and your past medical uh, issues. So uh, I'm not going to be able to comment on those. But more broadly, broad type, uh, type questions, um, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to address. Thank you, Al. Uh, I, I'm just going to begin by making a comment from my own perspective that I don't know that I've ever heard a better explanation about flares and these type one and type two symptoms before that was extremely helpful um, in understanding, I think, um, the, the frustration that people with lupus sometimes have when, mm -hmm. when they're, and we're not ta always talking about the same thing when we're talking about symptoms. So I think right. that was very helpful. Um, I wrote it all down because I I want to I want to include that in some things that I do in the future. So um and a couple of people have also commented on that that they found that to be um extremely helpful. So 
Um, thank you for that. So mm -hmm. um, we had a, a question going back to the tests, the lab tests. Mm -hmm. What happens if you run both ELISA and HEP2 on the same patient? Uh, do you get a clearer picture? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, so, um, so ELISA and HEP2 is being done by some labs. Um, one lab uh, in particular is um, Exogen Diagnostics. Now, for full disclosure, I do consult for them, so I do get some consulting fees for um, uh, providing uh, work. But uh, they do what they do there, and I think this is the standard would be they first do a, an ANA HEP2, right? And if it's positive, which is meaningless by itself, right? The negative is really helpful. If it's negative, you're done with the test, it's negative. But if it's positive, then they run the ELISA on top of that, okay? And if the ELISA is positive, then they call it positive, right? And so that actually does add some value. Um, there are times though where one is positive and the other one's not and this can get a little bit um confusing um i think the reason why uh, so you know what um exogen is trying to do is they're trying to kind of mainstream a lot of the lab tests so that you know when you go use them you always have the same platform every single time and so that gives you more consistency as opposed to going to say Quest one time or LabCorp the next time or a hospital lab the third time. There, you're definitely using different platforms and different tests and, uh, for the same test rather. And that becomes a little trickier when you're trying to do both, all right? So um, I think it does offer improvement. It's a great, great point. You're thinking like um, how these companies are thinking in terms of improving existing tests. Um, whether or not this can be applied to the other test is still to be seen, but definitely in ANAs, there could be added value if both are positive, the ELISA and the and the HEP2. Okay, great, thank you. Um, where do you see the most promising treatments on the horizon in terms of their mechanisms of action for SLE, particularly patients with significant kidney involvement? What's your opinion of velocosporin? Yeah, so yeah, there's two new ones, focosporin and uh, and and bulimimab, which is the new old kid on the block. Um, just to give you some ideas, uh, vocalosporin, also known as, known as leukinus, it's made by this company called Arinia, and I'm going to disclose here too, I get consulting fees for both GSK and Arinia, just FYI. So I'm I'm going to be biased both directions. I guess that's <laughs> the point. Um, so the data for really severe lupus nephritis and hitting a very difficult endpoint in lupus nephritis, something called a complete renal response with vocalsporin, um, it was some of the best data we've ever seen in any lupus trial ever, all right? Um, and so it has a lot of promise. Um, the side effect profile though is not trivial. 25% um, um, of people actually have a paradoxical reduction in kidney function because of the drug itself, not because it makes the lupus nephritis worse. It is reversible though. So again, these are kind of discussions that you will have with your rheumatologist and your kidney doctor, and you're trying to process and, and kind of prioritize what that means. On the other hand, Benlista or, or, or Benlimumab by GSK, they also have good lupus nephritis. It's not quite as good as uh, vocalsporin, but it's still substantially better than any of the other trials in the past, right? So again, these are the two new lupus nephritis drugs out there. Lup uh, ben Lista, though, has a very long track record in lupus. It definitely works for general lupus, not just lupus nephritis. And that could be a benefit, right? Because there's going to be, uh, we don't know if vocalsporin works for systemic lupus or if it's just for lupus nephritis. I will say that I wouldn't be too, again, if the, it just totally depends on the patient. I wouldn't be too scared about presenting the option of doing both at the same time, Benalista and Vocalsporin, because then you're able to do two very different ways of, of attacking lupus nephritis. And then on top of that, you, you get kind of the potency of Vocalsporin with the backup of you know, quelling um, systemic lupus also with Benalista or Bilimimab. So again, there are discussions, I don't know within the companies, but certainly within academic uh, lupus circles where we're thinking we should probably try to do both and see what, you know, what happens. So it's a, it's a, you know, this space is going to evolve so quickly. As you know, there's a new drug 
uh, for um, lo systemic lupus called anifrolumab or safnello by AstraZeneca. And so again, you can see how rapidly the space is evolving. You know, Ben Lista got approved 10 years ago. The prior uh, FDA, last FDA approved drug for lupus was um, uh, over 50 years be uh, before that. And now there's a 10 year gap. And then now three drugs got approved within a six month period for either lupus nephritis or systemic lupus, right? So this is gonna be a rapidly evolving space. My answer to this could change a lot in the next year. Let's just put it that way. Woo, woo, woo. That's <laughs> exciting, but it's happening in lupus right now. It's, it's mm -hmm. an exciting time uh, for us. So um, this is kind of a general question, and I'm not sure that you can answer it because it's so general, but just uh, how do you treat flares? And I think that goes back again okay. to your different types of flares. Mm -hmm. and, and Yeah, so I would say that um, the majority of our patients actually um, have present with both, right? Type one and type two, when they worsen together. Um, you know, so the type ones, um, you know, we still use prednisone to treat that flare. I think those days are going to slowly erode away. Prednisone works really well because it works fast and it's super potent, but its side effect profile is insanely long, all right? Um, it's, it's, it's very toxic when you have to take it for years on end. So there are a lot of strategies right now to try to figure out how do we treat flares without prednisone, right? We don't have clear answers right now. I have my own speculations then. I'm not gonna divulge right here, but um, I think that right now for type one, it is definitely gonna be things like steroids and then changing the type of medicines that you're on because maybe the combination of medicines that you're on wasn't sufficient to be able to kind of put that cap on that boiling water, right? Which is your flare. Type two, yeah, much trickier. Um, you know, this is again, this is where a village is really needed to be able to get things together. And again, I listed four, five, six different specialists that are, are likely going to be needed to in order to optimize um, kind of the treatment of type two symptoms. That's again, a lot trickier. And I think here uh, you have to work with your rheumatologist and actually figure out what specific symptoms because maybe someone doesn't have as much of an issue with depression, but they have a lot of issues with their sleep, all right? Then they don't need to see like a psychologist per se, they all need to see a sleep person or vice versa. Someone may sleep well, but they have massive issues with anxiety, all right? That's also affecting their lupus. So then they would, you know, so you, they need to see a different specialist for that. So that's gonna be very highly individualized, I think. I don't think there's gonna be one medicine that will do it all. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. There are a lot of questions. Oh, um, <laughs> and I mean, some of them are just statements. Again, Dr. Kim, thanks for the most understanding collaborative segment on medication adherence that I've heard. Um, but when you have elevated CSR, ASR, what test do you request to find out if it's bacterial infection? And can you give me an example of what kind of a bacterial infection it might be? Okay, so the second is easier. Uh, probably most commonly are urinary tract infections. Um, uh, the, the other things that can happen could be uh, cellulitis in the skin. You can get a cut and it gets really red and inflamed. That's usually due to a bacterial infection. Some forms of pneumonia, but also there's also pneumonias that can be viral in origin, you know, a virus. And so you would use different medicines for the two of, two of them. In terms of tests, is these are essentially going to be culture tests. So let's say that um, we always get urine cultures on all of our lupus patients just in case, because um, sometimes they can be asymptomatic and that could be problematic in the setting of having kind of a, a dampened immune system because of the medicines. So we get urine cultures in everyone that, we, that comes into our clinic um, every visit. And so that will tell us the urinary tract infection definitively. For things like pneumonias, there are things like chest x-rays, or you know, sometimes they'll do sputum cultures so that ask you, actually ask you to cough, and then the phlegm gets caught into a little cup, and then they send that to the microbiology lab where they'll try to isolate out bacteria that are growing in the phlegm. Um, so that could be done for bacterial pneumonias, for example. So again, these are all, you know, it's not as, orderly as I think people think. It's very fluid and a lot of it depends on, you know, whether or not, um, how strongly do you believe they have an infection? Because sometimes we'll just treat it as is without any additional testing, especially if the patient's very ill, where you can't really wait 
for the result, then we'll just go ahead and give antibiotics type of thing. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you'll uh, will kind of go more orderly and, uh, and 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 obtain more specific type tests that allow us to identify the bacteria that's causing the problem. Our EF, or I'm sorry, our EGFR non African American female low results indicative of a lupus flare. No, so. So uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate, that's EGFR, um, is a calculated approach that's not perfect, but a calculated approach to a kind of, um, uh, without directly measuring the kidney, um, to be able to see how much of your blood is being filtered into your glomerulus, which is your kind of the, the filter of the kidney in and of itself. So you want higher rates because that means it's filtering more. So, um, Low EGFRs can be very or not totally nonspecific. Um, if I dehydrate myself, my EGFR is going to drop just because my blood volume is going down and I have less fluid. All right, so I can reverse that by hydrating myself. Um, sometimes uh, there are other conditions: hypertension, diabetes, which also cause kidney injury separate from lupus. All right, so that can also drop your EGFR. Um, you know, it can be due to lupus too, uh, but I would need to see a lot more other things. Uh, I want to see if there are red blood cells in your urine or white blood cells in your urine, how much protein is in your urine. That will give me a lot more information rather than just looking at EGFR. EGFR actually, if it stays constant and is constantly low, usually is not reversible. And actually for your EGFR in those situations to drop, you have to actually basically kill off about 60% of your kidney. So again, GFRs are very um, crude instruments, and there are there are a lot of discussions, particularly on Twitter over the last month or so, uh, in the, in, amongst nephrologists about what do we do? What's the next better test to indicate kidney function changes that are much more sensitive? Okay, so you have a low EGFR, it happens. Um, we all age, so aging is actually the leading cause of reduced GFR. Um, that's just what happens. Our, our kidneys just don't like it when we age. And so almost everyone who's 70 or above has a low GFR, all right? So that, and that's without any disease, okay? So again, that tells you how, you know, how messy eGFR is. How common is it for skin lupus to become systemic? And is there any sign that that type of lupus is changing? Um, yeah, so that's actually an uh, interesting question. So, um, Usually in the first five years after diagnosis, the disease kind of cements itself. If it's just in the skin and you've had it for 10 years, really low likelihood it's gonna spread into other organs, like recruit other organs and cause damage there. Within the first five years of diagnosis, it can happen. And the skin tends to be the source of the main issues with lupus in general. Um, it's, it's the most exposed organ we have and of course it's also you know seen ultraviolet light so this is all problematic i don't know what percentage I, I would imagine that if you were initially diagnosed with skin lupus specifically there's going to be a non-zero but low chance it will become systemic i don't remember the number off the top of my head but it's 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 lower than i anticipated but I think also in some of these studies, they didn't account for the duration of their disease. Again, that first five years seems to be pretty important. Uh, again, once you hit that five-year period, your lupus kind of stays the way it w initially presented with. All right, so um, it's non-zero, but um, in terms of detecting it, this is all, I don't think lab tests are gonna help here at all. It's just gonna be how good of the rheumatologist you have that are asking questions about other manifestations of lupus chest pain, uh, you know, uh, joint pain, other things. Of course, you can have chest pain and joint pain for other reasons, right? So just having a, don't freak out, right? We're all human, we all have joint pain, we all have chest pains, all right? It's just the rheumatologist then is gonna be using their expertise and their experience then to be able to place context to those other symptoms and see if they're related to your skin issues, all right? So that's kind of the, contemporary way we diagnose lupus, which is very unsatisfying because it looks cryptic to everyone else. Um, I'm not sure what this question, it, it just says, what about red and white counts? 
I'm not sure they mean are you also testing for that or I'm not sure what yeah, I'm assuming they're red blood cell and white blood cell counts yeah so again you know these are good questions but the you know you're gonna get the same answer from me so many things can affect the counts so many things and that's the reason why I didn't even bring them up because even though we check them and sometimes they're abnormal I'm not 100% sure what to do with it because I can't tell if the lupus is driving it or not all right and what what kind of tips me towards action versus watching is how severe of a drop or how severe of an increase there is um you know so uh if there are extreme differences then uh, you know then red flags start going up and then we'll start working on trying to figure out if there are other things going on other than your lupus that may be driving it um but generally speaking um almost i would say the majority of lupus patients are anemic so you have red um uh, uh, red blood cells or hemoglobin or hematocrit those are the kind of the two lab tests in the complete blood count or the cbc that we typically surrogate uh, for um, red blood cell uh, sufficiency in the bloodstream um, in terms of white blood cells typically in lupus uh, if it's due to lupus we do see drops but medications can also drop your white blood cell count okay so you can see how tricky this is all is right so it takes again it takes experience and this is um, where we urge our patients when we release the labs to them and there's something abnormal, not to freak out initially, all right? All right? Because there are so many explanations. I, I may not even know what that explanation is either, all right? So we'll watch it and see. A lot of the times it just bounces right back up. It just happened because it happened. I, I'm not going to try to over explain it to them. But sometimes it stays durable and there then we can find other things. Sometimes it's lupus related, sometimes it's not um someone asked about the new medications but i think we've uh, talked about that yeah um uh, someone said thanks so much now i know i'm type two at times i feel like i'm crazy because i feel like i'm in a flare but the doctor tells me i'm good thanks again so mm -hmm. yeah and then that's important because you know if you if if you win that argument and convince your rheumatologist to give you more medicine they're treating the wrong disease right now you're being over medicated for your type 1 symptoms and that's going to just cause risk with no benefit all right so again, again the, these these people at duke just took what was kind of in, obvious to us but we just didn't explain it this way and gave us words to be able to explain it you know so i i really i really admire you know them just saying you know what this is this is what we're seeing but this is how we're going to explain it and obviously it's working for you guys too yeah uh, what is your opinion on rituxab for lupus nephritis treatment? I'm biased here. I love rituximab. I love taking out B cells. Um, but I think um, COVID has changed my mind about that. Uh, the leading risk factor for having uh, severe COVID um, in um, autoimmune patients are, is, are, is, are drugs like rituximab. Uh, or similar ones, ocrelizumab. There's another one called ofenitumumab. I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> um, but you know, all of these drugs get rid of your B cells. And on top of that, it's also quite clear that the majority of people who get B cell depleting therapies like rituximab mount crap vaccine responses to SARS-CoV-2 um, because the antibodies that we measure come from B cells. But I just got rid of your B cells with rituximab, right? So you can see where the problem is. So I'm, I'm trying to decide right now, because it's so effective, particularly for uh, pe um, uh, people of color, um, Blacks, Asians, Hispanics. B cell depletion therapies in our experience here work really, really well in them, all right? And if you ignore viruses, largely, it's really safe. SARS-CoV-2, COVID has changed that a lot, all right? And it's, it's, it's shading my influence about, you know, how do, we, how do we mitigate the risk that you could have of having lost, you know, COVID protection because you're now on rituximab, right? But at the same time, I gotta treat, we gotta treat your disease, which could also potentially shorten your lifespan, right? So there's a lot of uh, individual discussions that have to occur when, you know, when now when we're starting these type of medicines. So again, for lupus, I love it, particularly for non-white. Uh, but in this particular environment, rituximab is tricky. Um, we hear a lot about lupus nephritis, but how often do you see um, liver involvement? 
Not commonly. Um, you know, sometimes, most of the time we see it in the context of another disease called auto, autoimmune hepatitis. Um, liver involvement can occur. It's not, in, you know, based on what's been described, it's, it's not common. Um, and I, whenever I hear someone that may have liver involvement um, due to lupus, I'm immediately thinking there's going to be other reasons for it. Um, so that's what I would do, you know, if I had you as a patient. I would look for the other reasons, then prove myself wrong, and then ascribe it to lupus at the end of the day, if that ends up being the case. Can voclosporin be primary medication for lupus nephritis or just add on to MMF? So, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm curious where who this who asked this question. Um, uh, the FDA label mandates it has to be add on, right? This is more important, I think, from a um, insurance perspective. All right, um, Volcosporin, you know, all of these new medications are not inexpensive. All right, there, um, there's a substantial cost to the healthcare system overall. There may not be a cost to you as the patient, but the healthcare system definitely absorbs a cost. Um, and that's true for a lot of the newer medicines for whatever disease, you know, cancer, whatever. Um, so, you know, I would use it potentially as primary. I may use it with mycophenolate though. Let's say I have a brand new lupus nephritis patient that came in and we were able to negotiate that Volcosporin and was the best way to go. There, in that case, I would say let's do Volcosporin with Salcept at the same time. All right. Not only because um, we know that the two of them work together in the clinical trial. Um, it's also you know, and it's not that I don't think it's going to work. It's I, I let me put it this way. I don't it. I don't know if it will work by itself. All right. I think it will. Right, but the problem here, ultimately, end of the day, is once the patient gets out of the hospital, how is insurance going to cover it? Right, so you really want to make sure that you that you know, providers we are very aware and careful about how the FDA label looks for each medicine, right? Because that specifically licenses us to be able to prescribe it under very specific circumstances. All right, so it has to be active lupus that's autoantibody positive with these other things and as soon as we know that you uh, you fit the criteria we know insurance will pay for it at the end of the day if you don't fit the criteria the insurance company actually is allowed to not pay for it okay so that's kind of the real world answer the non-real world answer the theoretical answer i I'd, I'd use it i'd use it first line yeah and again like i said earlier i'd to i would love to use it with ben lista I would love to use it with Ben Lista. I would like to see how that works out. It makes it sound like that the patient's a little bit of a guinea pig. I'm, I mean, I don't mean that, but at the same time, you can see that you know we're dealing with a with a big unknown here. That could get kind of pricey, though, couldn't it? Was that? That could get kind of pricey, couldn't it? Oh, 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 well, yeah, right, yeah. No, this is that's going to be the long-term problem that's going to happen with that combination is going to be cost and so yeah. you know and but these studies are going to take a long time to do because what we're trying to do i think at the end of the day is reduce damage to the organ so there's a difference between disease activity with the way we talk about medically is disease activity versus damage disease activity is reversible organ injury all right so you have a little bit of inflammation you treat it you know there's no scarring or anything damage is irreversible organ injury and so that is going to be largely scarring. Reason why we're talking more about damage is because lupus patients are living longer. So we now have to think about the long-term end game right off the bat, all right? But those studies take five to 10 years to do, damage studies do, all right? So, you know, if we wanted to see whether or not Volcosporin and Benlista together are better than Volcosporin alone or Benlista alone for lupus nephritis damage, we're not going to know that for a while. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, you asked a question that I think is probably a little too specific and one that um, Dr. Kim won't be able to answer. Um, I, I think we're just, it's, we're, we're losing people now. So I think we'll okay. just take these last two questions. Um, how common is it for Ben List uh, to lose its efficacy over time? It happens. I don't know how common it is. Um, but you know we do see this with not just Ben Lista, we see it with every medication that a small percentage of people, um, the the effect, the efficacy, or you know its its positive effect 
uh, kind of loses its durability. We don't know why this is, um, whether or not the disease has become more resistant. I don't really know what that word means, but it makes sense conceptually. Um, or whether or not the disease has evolved, right? So that it's using other inflammatory pathways instead of you know ones that it originally did. Um, and, you know, we see some evidence of this occurring in rheumatoid arthritis where if you use a certain drug for a long period of time, the disease kind of changes, it's forced to change what pathways it uses, uh, that which then can trigger some additional um, worsening of disease. Um, so again, it's not that common, but it, we we uh, do see it. Okay, I think that'll be the last question. I do want to remind everybody that this was recorded. A couple of you have asked some questions about uh, where you can find this. As soon as we have it ready, we will upload it to our YouTube page, and you'll get an email telling you that it's been. Um, uploaded so you can watch it again if you like um, and also if you subscribe to our YouTube channel then you can get um, notices anytime that we upload a video so I want to thank Dr. Kim he always takes time out of his busy schedule to help us to answer your questions um, and to share uh, information with all of you so I want to thank all of you for attending and thank Dr. Kim and uh, we hope you all have, have a nice evening all right take care Bye, thanks.